you enjoyed the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. talk about your time on the two squadrons you flew with yeah and did you ever conduct any DACT because I'm fascinated and how did the lightning fare against the types <laughs> of the time uh, yeah uh, I would I was really lucky um, in the period when I when I went to the lightning because of course there was an end game the lightning for many years and certainly in the early days they did very little air combat training at all and DACT you know I guess if you spoke to somebody who was on the squadrons in the in the 60s and maybe even to the set in well into the 70s you know they probably did very little ACT I we you know I was really lucky we were really lucky and myself in black and the crowd who sort of went through in those latter few years because there was an end in sight they knew the airplane was finally going to be going out of service when the F3 came in and so they looked at the fatigue that was available uh, on the aeroplanes. So I went, well, we can afford to do this now. So as I went through the LTF, they actually changed the course and they actually included more air combat training. Brilliant. Uh, now we didn't do any DACT on the LTF because a lot of what you do on, on uh, OCUs is, is very canned training. But certainly when we got out onto the squadron, yes, we did. Um, and I was very, very lucky in that in my first year, I did DACT uh, against uh, the American aggressors. We used to have a, an aggressor squadron F5, based in the, in the UK. Yeah, they were at Alconbury yeah. and they were F5, F5Es. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they were really good. They were a great training asset uh, because of course they were Soviet, you know, stroke Warsaw Pact experts. And you've got to bear in mind, this was still in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah by this stage, you know, so the Warsaw Pact and the Soviets were still very, very much our enemy at the time. And, um, and so they used to come along and uh, teach you the tactics that things like MiG-21s uh, would be able to employ. Um, and the great thing about the F-5 was it's a really small aeroplane like the MiG-21 was, so really difficult mm -hmm. to spot head on. Um, I remember doing a couple of uh, DACT flights uh, against, the, uh, against the aggressors. Um, and I sort of vaguely remember faring okay because of course they were operating the aeroplane very much um, as, as a Soviet would operate a MiG-21. Yeah. yeah, so they're, they're, they're operating it as that rather than really going for it with the, with the F-5 which I know is quite, quite, a, quite an amazing aeroplane. Um, you know, so it was to teach me the, the confidence in the tactics. Um, did a little bit against F-16s. Uh, my first, uh, I was very, very lucky in that uh, my first NATO squadron exchange was to Belgium um, and uh, we went out to uh, Bovachain, which was the home of 349 and 350 uh, squadrons, Belgian Air Force, and they were pure uh, air defence uh, F-16 squadrons back in those days. Um, you know, the Belgian Air Force, like many of our European forces of you know, shrunk. In fact, we have we've shrunk yep. accordingly as well. Uh, but back then, they were pure air defence squadrons, and we did a bit of DACT against them, and it was demoralising. <laughs> it really was demoralising because you could yeah. meet these guys head on, uh, unless you got them unsighted, which was very very unlikely. Yeah. You know, then you you had no chance. We we did more sort of stuff uh, with the F-16s. Uh, doing what we called mixed fighter force uh, against uh, ground attack guys um, when we were operating out of uh, out of Belgium, mm -hmm. did get a flight in the F-16 as well, which nice. was quite awesome. Yeah, I can um, that was my first flight in an F-16. Um, other airplanes did uh, DACT against uh, was quite often the uh, was quite often the F-4. Our um, F-4. Our F-4. Yeah. Um, I don't don't recall ever doing anything against any any other air forces F-4, but certainly d we did quite quite a bit of stuff. Uh, against the Watersham uh, wing, which was uh, uh, 56 and 74 squadrons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the Lightning fared pretty well, you know, overall. I mean, obviously, disadvantages, the F-4 had a much better radar. 
you know, because they had pulse Doppler radar with a much greater range. Uh, and of course, they had the Sparrow missile as well. So they had, the, they had the ability to shoot beyond visual range. And of course, biggest disadvantage with the airplanes, they had no radar warning receivers. So you had no idea whether you were being targeted or not. Yeah. You had to assume you were. And so your, t your tactics were always uh, devised around assuming that you were being targeted. So you would so do all- the whole, the whole time you're just assuming. <laughs> you would, you, yeah. Uh, and, and you can, you, you can preempt, you know, if you know roughly what their, what, what their shooting ranges are going to be, then you do something approaching that range to mess up their air picture and to try and get into the merge unsighted. If we got into the merge unsighted, you know, start doing a turning fight with an F4, then, uh, then you know, you're evenly, relatively evenly matched. I mean, certainly one of the great advantages of this aeroplane that was the ability to take take the fight vertical. Yeah. So rather than going round and round and round level, uh, or in descending turn, if you had enough energy, you could loop the aeroplane. Could a um, keep up with you in that? Uh, if they were light point? and they had the energy, yes. But if they bled the energy, then they would struggle to right. to be able to get up. So they used to have to generally stay f flat if they burnt off too much energy. Mm -hmm. Yes, they could come up and meet you. You know, if 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 they were canny and they had sufficient energy, yes, they could go vertical. But again, you'd be meeting over the top, and the advantage that you had with this aeroplane, and it was something they showed us on, on, the, uh, on the conversion, is that because it's effectively a delta wing aeroplane, you can vary the amount of, of, I mentioned about the buffet earlier, the buffet is the pre-stall buffet. Um, and you, uh, you know, you're, certainly when you're doing a turning fight, you're always turning in that buffet. And the level of the buffet um, you know, varies from a small amount to a lot. Um, and the great thing about the Lightning was it, it was generally a very, very easily, easy handling aeroplane. You know, it didn't have any significant vices mm -hmm. compared to, you know, if you, if you pulled too much in the Phantom, it would depart and depart very, very spectacularly. You so know, it was out nothing of control like the F4 because that had a bad reputation. It had a really bad reputation. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I never flew the F4, but I understand that, you know, if it buffeted, you couldn't use the, the ailerons at all to roll because, yeah, of course, it used spoilers. Uh, and uh, so the thing would depart. Whereas this, you know, actually handled really, really well. Right. Um, you know, in, in a lot of heavy buffet. And one of the things that you could do in this, you could pull up for a loop at 450 knots. You could go over the top of the loop, then pull into really heavy buffet and keep the speed. And the speed would stick back sort of below 300 knots. And you could pull out of the loop about 2,000 feet above where you'd started. And of course, that's a great advantage if you're following an aeroplane you know, trying to dive down and not, not lose too much energy. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and it, it did, it, you know, if you were pulling too hard, it had its little, little hint. It used to hint to you because the nose used to wander so a little bit. You. It would tell you, mm -hmm. yeah, because I, I did do it once, actually, DACT against some F4s. We'd gone into a merge, we were doing a 2v2, uh, and the plan was that my, my colleague would go in level and I would go into the merge and I'd go vertical over the top, choose my moment and pitch down. And I remember watching this, this fight going on below me, looking out, because of course I'm upside down over the top of it. And I pulled and the world rotated through about 90 degrees. <laughs> Ooh. Oh <dear. laughs> but you know, it was easily recoverable and I uh, just unloaded the wing and it stopped, the world stopped going around and I carried on fighting, you know? So uh, I do remember that, you know? So the aeroplane, if you were pulling too hard, used to, I, I do remember, used to want, you know, the nose would start wandering and start sort of yawing out of the, a turn if you're in a turn. Mm -hmm. and, and that was it, hinting, mm, don't pull any harder. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have you if you keep doing yeah, this. Exactly. <laughs> so, and it, and it did on that particular day. So, uh, um, also, also fought against the F3 as well. Um, and again, you know, actually it was reasonably, you know, reasonably equal, you know, against the F3. You know, in a in a visual fight, uh, again the F3 had you know had a better radar. Although back in those days when we did it, it was very rare that they actually had a working radar because the, the 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 early days of the AI24 and the Tornado F3 was just appalling. Mm -hmm. You know, so quite often it was just going to a visual fight with these guys, uh, and of course they were still learning the airplane as well. The, the the people we fought against, you know, it was their relatively early days, you know, on the F3. Yeah, I think you know, in subsequent years when I moved onto that aeroplane myself, we got better at teaching people combat. Oh, right, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, so, so in subsequent years, you know, in, in sort of recent years, sort of 1990s onwards, we focused a lot more on air combat flying. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit like the old 
uh, American Navy and the Top Gun story of the 1960s in Vietnam. Yeah. You know, they didn't really teach uh, DACT um, and therefore the guys were poorly equipped to actually do visual manoeuvring. They then started Top Gun and started teaching people how to fight the aeroplane properly. And of course, it completely changes the dynamic, mm -hmm. you know, so, so you could get, you know, it, it, you know, it got a lot better in subsequent years, you know, with that complete change in focus. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the focus had very much been, you know, in the 60s and 70s, and even the early 80s, you know, on intercepting rather than fighting. Mm -hmm. But of course then, you know, for us in Europe, you know, MiG-29, well, in the, in the UK, when the MiG-29 came along, we went, well, it's never going to get here, you know, because it was such a short range aeroplane. And then SU-27 came along and that completely changed it. And yeah. went, ooh, actually, you know, now when we go off to intercept the bears over the North Sea, it's not, not just the bears yeah. that's now an issue. It's now potentially an SU-27, mm -hmm. you know, environment as well. Yeah. So we had to change our thinking. Yeah, makes sense. You know? yeah.